This is probably the most impressive stage I've ever been on. You should see it from the back. It has so much technology in the back. It's really impressive. My name is Mercedes Banz. Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, about understanding AI. So I will do the opposite what Anil did in the first part. So he made you uncertain of your brain and of your perception. I'm going to try to make you uncertain about algorithms. Um, so I'm coming to algorithms since a very long time. I was quite early interested in how knowledge and power is shifted by algorithms and social media. And of course, as this is a presentation that is linked to the internet, there needs to be a cat somewhere. So here it is. Um, and th from the power and knowledge and being interested how social media and search engines are changing how we perceive the world, I moved on and I was quite interested in how things are being changed when they become intelligent. So together with my lovely colleague, Graham Michael, who you can see here, I wrote a book uh, about things and how they learn to speak and how they learn to see. And uh, parts of it was fueled by artificial intelligence and machine learning, which I will talk about. And you all are aware of this. The biggest hype, of course, here is self-driving cars. Now, um, I would like to link my interest and my research about artificial intelligence to the question of the conference, what kind of species are we? Now, if you think of all of you um, and about what was the first thing probably that you did this morning, I assume that a lot of you reached out to their phone and turned off the alarm on their smartphone. So nowadays, smartphones are always somehow nearby. If any one of you has ever lost their smartphone, the feeling how lost you feel without a phone is quite intense. So we can, to a certain extent, say that in the 21st century, we are human beings with technology. What does this mean? As a bit what we research at the Digital Department for Digital Humanities, we are interested in how is our relationship with technology. We are interested in new developments in artificial intelligence and how algorithms learn to process meaning. And because this is quite new, um, it's quite important that we understand how our relationship is. Um, we are in a new phase, and I will explain to you a little bit how artificial intelligence algorithms work, because this is really a new development that is just a few years old. All of you use artificial intelligence already. Any one of you who has sent a text message, you know this is, is called predictive texting. So you see I type a message, uh, made a screenshot yesterday, and uh, the phone already knows the word I'm going to write. And uh, this is already natural language processing. So this is artificial intelligence. It's not something that is very far away. It's among all of us, and we use it already every day. The research that we're doing at our department is we look on one hand at the technical capabilities of new artificial intelligence, that means we read and try to keep track on computer science studies, we read their papers, we follow their discussions and their conferences, and then we look how this is different to how society discusses artificial intelligence and how these two discourses overlap or not. And that's quite interesting because they do not overlap a lot. Um, so if we go back to how is our relationship with technology, what would you think? especially when it comes to artificial intelligence, it is very miserable. So we think artificial intelligence is our enemy, it will take over the world, it's quite hostile. Here you can see two film posters, Terminator and the newer one, which is a very good movie, even though I don't share the foundation assumptions, um, Ex Machina. Um, and this is where I'd like to take you away from. I think we should need to stop to think about artificial intelligence as our enemy. Um, if we go, and I think Maturana and Varela might become the most quoted philosophers at this conference, Anil quoted Varela as well. Um, if we go to this quote, man made machines are all made with some purpose, practical or not, but with some aim that man specifies, I think that's quite an important point they made very long ago, and I think that's still true today. So the stereotype, how we react towards technology, is we see technology as our enemy. Uh, and I will try to show you that this is a misunderstanding, that it's an interpre interpretation of artificial intelligence 
as if it would be a human subject. But it is not, of course. What we need to know is that new artificial intelligence is calculating meaning. So this is really a really recent new development. Traditionally, we know that computers and algorithms are really good in processing numbers. Now, here you can see a new development that they can now process language and images. And this is a much more ambiguous field that they just advanced to in the last few years. And this is quite important for all of us to know and deal with and, and be responsible for this because technology companies reach deeper into the organisms of our society, organizations of our society than ever before. And, um, you know already how we always feel that technology companies are shaping our lives. Now this will become even more. And I think that's quite important to understand and to deal with. Um, what we try to do, therefore, is a lot to explain artificial intelligence, and we try to take people's hand to understand artificial intelligence, because we're all going to work and live with it. Um, so the question um, that we need to know is, what is new AI really good in? And where is it making mistakes? Because if you know where it makes mistakes, um, you are better in working with it. The first thing that's quite important is that machine intelligence is really not human intelligence. And that is something that is uh, a lot of time missed. They function really, really differently. And I'm quite interested in machine logic and machine intelligence, and I find it fascinating. So I think if we think of artificial intelligence as nothing else, as something that wants to conquer us, we really lose a very important and fascinating aspect. So the first thing you need to know is that this is a new programming paradigm that you see. Traditionally, computer scientists programmed by uh, writing code. Machine learning, new artificial intelligence, doesn't work like this anymore. So you see that computer scientists create a framework, and instead of writing the code, they make the machine write the code. So how does the machine write the code? The machine writes the code, but you feed it with lots and lots of examples, thousands. It really needs a lot. Now, here you have the first really big difference between human logic and machine logic. If you go to your child and you explain to your child, this is a cat, your child understands with the first cat what a cat is, and if another cat comes by, it knows this is also a cat. If you would feed a machine learning program one example, it would see nothing. It couldn't understand anything. So artificial intelligence needs thousands of examples to learn from those examples. Now, why is this the case? Um, it's quite interesting. You can see that here um, there's this diagonal line node. So this is a computer interface structure. and. Um, in the very beginning, the algorithm doesn't understand an image. It just sees pixels in relation to pixels. And then it looks at really abstract elements of those pixels. It looks at edges, shapes, and shades of color. It can't really see an object. It can actually never really see an object. It just identifies shapes. On the basic analysis, they learn from, if those diagonal lines come up a lot, then Later on, I know this might be a face or a cat. So it really understands and calculates on a very, very basic level. And then later on, it can identify what's on an image. One thing that uh, has been quite a milestone in artificial intelligence, and especially in image recognition um, and in machine learning, is the ImageNet challenge, which started 2009. And I brought to you an example what algorithms can do now and how they learn by this process that I explained to you to understand images and relate them to language. So they generate image descriptions. So here we have a few examples from an experiment from 2015. And you can see it works quite well. Girl in pink dress is jumping in the air. Or black and white dog jumps over a bar. So fine, so good. But then the algorithm struggles, and it misidentifies at times. A cat is sitting on a couch with a remote control. My favorite example is this. It's a baby that's holding a toothbrush, and the computer thinks a young boy is holding a baseball bat. 
And uh, at other times, it is here seeing a horse standing in the middle of a road. Um, by now, the algorithms have become a little bit better, but because they only see those abstract shades, those problems can come up any time. And if you work with artificial intelligence, you need to know about the fact that this can happen. Um, so on one hand, new artificial intelligence can process data rapidly, and on the other hand, it also has its weaknesses and makes a lot of mistakes. Now, we uh, all uh, will work with artificial intelligence. There are a lot of studies out there that 45 to 50 jobs are going to be transformed. So it's very likely that in the next 10 years, you all will work with one or the other artificial intelligence program. Sometimes you don't realize. But if we come to areas which are quite sensitive, we really need to know about what we're doing and how we work with these algorithms. So we speak to a lot of researchers in our department um, that work with artificial intelligence. And I brought you one example from the Netherlands. We recently had a visit from uh, the predictive policing unit of Amsterdam. They have developed an algorithm about crime anticipation and sent their officers there, which has been developed in-house. So we talk to them and try to understand who knows about the program, who has knowledge in the police about this, and what could go wrong. Uh, the same is what we do uh, with this example. That's a medical image. That's a project of DeepMind, quite a big artificial intelligence company that is done with a hospital in London. And you can see those medical scans. So artificial intelligence programs are really good in understanding medical scans. And this is quite an outstanding development. We try to understand how doctors cannot get a result from the artificial intelligence algorithm, but can understand also and question the algorithm on the back. How did you come to this decision? How do you see this? Um, so new AI can also be tricked. And this is something, uh, yeah, we also need to be aware of. Um, here, I promise you more cats. Uh, you can see the picture of a tabby cat. And you can see here that um, the computer is to 85% quite certain that this is a tabby cat, or it might be a tiger cat, or a bit of Egyptian cat. It is not very certain that this is a carton or a plastic bag. So it has, it's quite spot on. Now, this is an experiment that students of MIC did, at MIT, who call themselves Lab 6. And then what they did is they added noise to it in the background. And because um, it is uh, that computer just sees pixels and edges and shapes, the noise cannot be seen by us. So the picture of the cat looks like this. We see clearly a cat. The computer all of a sudden is 100% sure this is guacamole. So this is an effect that's quite important to know if you think, think of medical images and insurance companies uh, you know, you could easily trick the doctor would say, okay, this picture is all right, but the algorithm would clearly say, okay, this is, you are not ill, you don't get, you know, you do not get your insurance out, you have to pay for it yourself. So these aspects are really, really important to know if you work with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is super interesting. It can process images really fast. It is really in a new step. It starts to understand meaning, but it also can make mistakes. Um, we can see in the UK that it's used in areas of public service, medicine, policing, and transport in cities. And our department has been involved. Um, there's a the government tried to understand how to advance at I, where should we go? And we gave some policy recommendations. And some of you might know this famous Chilean picture of the project CyberSign from the 70s. Um, artificial intelligence this time um, does not, it looks super design. <laughs> but this approach was for the few and not for the many. It was not transparent and ethical data. That was uh, a project which was the government keeping the data. So in the UK, uh, the House of Lords tries to go in another direction. Um, they try policy recommendations. Uh, one of them is to support artificial intelligence literacy. We need 
public knowledge, how artificial intelligence works. I found that in Santiago, you have quite a big group of researchers that are working on machine learning, and this needs to become more. You have 3,030 members here in this group, uh, and I learned about quite a few projects here in Chile as well. What's quite important as a government is that the government is not buying artificial intelligence services from American companies as a black box. It's quite important to develop them in-house. If you want to question algorithms, if you want a transparent, democratic artificial intelligence, you need to develop them in-house to understand what they're doing. Um, you need to create public service data sets in areas such as medicine, transport, city, and infrastructure. If you do not, do not know which data was used to teach the algorithm, you can be not sure if the, uh, the material is not be biased, which is something we see quite a lot. So to return to uh, this quote and show you one last example how important that is, man-made machines are all made with some purpose, practical or not, but with some aim that man specifies. I brought you an example that I love very much and find quite funny. Um, it's a Facebook AI research. Something that's a little bit worrying is that we see the research that's most progressive, of course, again, by the typical companies, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and so on. But they did quite an interesting experiment. So they taught chatbots uh, to negotiate something, a ball, book, and a hat, and to negotiate who gets what and to exchange that. So they had 5,808 dialogues of humans who negotiated this, and then they fed that to chatbots. And then to speed up the process, they let the chatbots negotiate with each other. So what happened after a while? Of course, the chatbots negotiated pretty well, but the humans had forgotten to tell them something. They had forgotten to tell them they should do the negotiations in human language. So the chatbots developed their own language, which you can see here. And this is my last example, how important it is that man specifies uh, really and is responsible for what machine learning is doing. And the most impressive thing about this is that um, the bots even, yeah, they even negotiated this. So it worked in this weird language. They did a successful process and made a deal in the end. So to sum up, I think machine intelligence is a fantastic field full of surprises, as one that you just saw. And I think uh, when we think of us as being with technology, this technology needs to be open to all. It needs to be developed in a democratic way and in a transparent and ethical way. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>